We now turn to the skills of advanced canoe handling. Before proceeding, let's quickly review the three basic paddle strokes. There is the cruise stroke, which propels the craft forward, the J stroke, which governs course and direction, and feathering, which moves the whole of the canoe sideways. To achieve maximum maneuverability, you need three more. They are the draw or pull, push, and reverse or back strokes. The first two, the draw and push, will cause the quick turning of the canoe. They are used most frequently in turbulent or fast water conditions. As its name suggests, the draw or pull stroke is affected by forcefully pulling the paddle toward the canoe. This causes it to move in the opposite direction. With the push stroke, the paddle is pushed away from the canoe. The craft moves in the same direction as the paddle. With both strokes, the blade is parallel to the side of the canoe. The depth of the blade will depend on how quickly you wish to turn the canoe and, of course, the depth of the water itself. Regardless of depth, the stroke must be quick and forceful. The amount of force will depend on the speed and degree of the turn desired. Since both strokes cause a sideways movement, you must kneel to assure stability. Otherwise, the sudden turning can result in a capsize. Last is the reverse or backstroke. This is the basic forward cruise stroke in reverse. It allows you to either slow, turn, stop, or move the canoe in reverse. The degree of effort will depend on what you wish to accomplish. In turbulent or fast water, be sure to grasp the paddle securely. That's the six basic paddle strokes. They allow you to control both the movement and direction of the canoe under any conditions. Let's just run through them one more time. The forward cruising stroke. The J stroke. Feathering. The push. And pull strokes. And the back stroke. Using them either alone or in combination, the canoe can be moved straight ahead, ahead to the left or right, in reverse, sideways, or pivoting in any direction. Once mastered, your next challenge is to know which stroke to use at any given time and when to use it. While the strokes themselves can be perfected with practice, the ability to know when and how to use them will only come with experience. Once achieved, you will be an accomplished canoeist. When traveling by canoe, the bow paddler sets the pace. Varying from 20 to 50 strokes per minute, the pace set will depend on your desired speed. The longer and harder the pull, the more energy required and the greater the forward thrust. When conditions are turbulent, during a storm or when one is forthcoming, don't attempt to cross a large open body of water. The impact of a large wave could cause a sudden shift of weight, resulting in a capsize or swamping. When conditions are unsettled, head for land and wait for them to improve. Generally, the best times to travel large bodies of water are early morning and evening. Normally, there is no wind or it is not as severe. If you must cross a large body of water in a strong wind, travel the leeward shore, that from which the wind is blowing. The extra time and distance necessary will be more than offset by the added margin of safety. 
When traveling into a headwind with waves large enough to break against and over the bow, you initiate a diversionary course called quartering. This is affected by steering 10 to 15 degrees off the wave center. Taking care not to turn broadside, this course reduces the effect of the waves and makes it easier to proceed forward. If traveling with higher waves, the stern may swamp. Now this can occur while the canoe is in a trough and a wave crests behind it. It can be avoided by slowing the forward motion. To do so, take an open teapot or a can, attach approximately 10 to 15 feet of rope and allow it to drag behind. If severe turbulence does occur while crossing a wide body of water, don't panic. Sit on the bottom to lower the center of gravity and increase stability. At the same time, control direction to assure the canoe doesn't turn broadside to the waves. Now let's turn to the actions necessary in the event of a capsize or swamping. You will normally have little or no advance warning. If the canoe capsizes, jump well clear to avoid being hit as it overturns. Once it has settled, return and then hang on. Remember that a canvas cedar strip canoe or one of other construction with proper flotation material or air chambers will not sink. It will support the weight of the occupants and their gear. Be prepared for the canoe to bob or for one end to submerge if weight is placed on it. Don't attempt to climb on or into the canoe while it is submerged. Just hold on. You can then initiate and follow the necessary procedures. First, check for the whereabouts and well-being of the other occupants. Make sure everyone is wearing a life jacket. Next, locate and secure paddles. If the canoe is overturned, place them on top. If right side up, place them inside. Then remove your footwear. This will reduce the energy you require to tread water and kick, both necessary to move or stabilize the craft. Under cold water conditions, you need every ounce of energy to survive. So it's a good idea to be prepared for this by assuring boots or shoes can be removed with ease. When removed, tie them together and secure them to the canoe. You can now direct your efforts towards finding and retrieving your gear. If it has floated a distance away, consider whether you are in condition to give chase. Remember, distance is very deceptive on water. Eliminate the possibility of becoming separated from the canoe due to hypothermia, exhaustion, or the drifting of the craft itself. If gear has moved some distance away, it is better to wait until after the situation has returned to normal. Tie or secure gear which can be retrieved to the structure of the canoe. This will avoid further loss. Finally, there's the canoe itself. A decision must be made whether to empty and right it or move it. This will depend on the distance from shore. Remember, distance on water is far greater than appears to the eye. A shoreline which looks close may be far away. If you decide to move to shore, the canoe is propelled from behind. This is not difficult. A canoe resting upside down in the water has great buoyancy. This is due to an air pocket which forms between the water's surface and the interior of the upturned bottom. This pocket makes the craft extremely light and maneuverable. In fact, it's far easier to move and propel than if turned right side up and full of water. While this is true in relatively calm water, the reverse is the case with any turbulence or wind. Under these conditions, the buoyancy of the upturned craft causes it to drift, making it difficult to steer or direct. 
While it will be heavier if right side up and full of water, it also will be easier to steer and direct. In summary then, when propelling a capsized or swamped canoe, in calm water conditions, move it upside down. When there is turbulence or wind, move it right side up and full of water. Now, before moving on, let's quickly review what we have just covered. You achieve maximum paddling efficiency by setting a comfortable pace. In each sweep, fully submerge the blade and pull hard. Don't cross a large body of water if there is a strong wind or a storm is forthcoming. And if you must travel, keep to the leeward shore. When traveling the same direction as large waves, the canoe can be slowed by dragging weight. If heading into waves, their impact can be offset by quartering. If a canoe capsizes, jump clear. Then return and hang on. Follow these procedures. Check for the occupants. Retrieve paddles. Remove footwear and if within safe distance, retrieve gear. You have the choice of moving the canoe to shore or emptying and righting it. Before moving to shore, assure the distance is safe. If the water is calm, move it upside down. When there is any turbulence, move it right side up and full of water. We will next turn to emptying and righting a canoe. When the canoe is capsized or swamped and the distance to shore is too great, you have four alternatives. Each will depend on differing circumstances. The first is possible when there is another upright canoe nearby. It will affect the rescue operation. The swamped or capsized canoe must be upside down in the water. The rescue craft moves to a position where its midpoint is located at one end. The occupants then reach over and lift the end, pulling it on board upside down. Because of the buoyancy created by the air pocket, the upturned canoe will lift easily. The occupants of the upturned canoe can assist by holding onto the rescue craft to provide a balancing effect. The upturned canoe is pulled across the gunnels until it balances. Then it is turned right side up and placed back in the water ready for re-entry. Let's watch it one more time. Each of the remaining alternatives is affected when there isn't another canoe nearby. The first is used when there are two occupants who are both strong swimmers. Again, the canoe must be upside down to assure buoyancy. Each person moves to opposite ends, grasping them from underneath. Using a strong scissor kick, they forcefully lift each end in unison. As the air pocket breaks, the canoe will bob out of the water. In the same movement, they lift the canoe high enough so it clears the water's surface. As it clears, it is rotated so it returns right side up and empty. The second is used if you are alone. You must, of course, be a strong and accomplished swimmer. Start with the canoe upside down, so our old friend the air pocket is created. Swim underneath so your head comes up in the air pocket with the shoulders below the thwart. Take a deep breath, then use a strong scissor kick to lift you out of the water. With the air pocket providing the initial buoyancy, push your shoulders against the thwart, forcing the canoe upwards. As it breaks the surface, lift it as high as possible, at the same time rotating it to a position right side up. Both these procedures require great strength. 
the last is used when you are not a strong swimmer or do not have the strength necessary to lift the craft. In this case, the canoe is turned right side up. You start by rocking it either side to side or end to end. Use quick but strong pushing and pulling action. This will make the water splash and wash over the sides. Take care, however, that the ends or the gunnels do not go below the water's surface. Otherwise, the canoe will resubmerge. While this will not empty out all of the water, it will remove enough to allow careful re-entry. Before re-entering, make sure enough water is removed so the canoe doesn't swamp with your added weight. Use extreme care on entering so the weight of the water inside the canoe doesn't shift. Once inside, the rest of the water is removed by hand splashing and bailing. It's a good idea to secure a can or baler to the canoe for this purpose. While writing or emptying a canoe is one problem, another is re-entry from the water. If there are two persons, only one should enter at a time. This is best affected over the bow or stern. First, get one hand on or as close to the side opposite as possible. Using a strong scissor kick, raise your body upwards, at the same time pulling towards the opposite side. As your body rises, extend your weight across the craft. This helps distribute the weight and avoid a further capsize. The first person to enter assists the next by using the body weight as a counterbalance. A word of advice. As these procedures are emergency measures, practice until you can achieve them with confidence. Now to a few pointers on loading the canoe. When placing gear inside, do so carefully. Do not drop it on the bottom. Place it so the weight is evenly distributed. With all occupants and their gear on board, the canoe should ride level on the water surface. Gear should be packed securely and compact. When possible, wedge packs under the thwart. This will provide added support in the event of a capsize. Secure gear so it won't shift in turbulence. If possible, tie it to the canoe so it won't separate in the event of an upset. Don't overload. When fully loaded, there should be at least six inches of freeboard. Having looked at loading, let's reverse and unload. This is necessary to move the canoe over land. Called portaging, the craft is carried while upside down with the thwart resting against the back of the neck and shoulders. When there are two thwarts, the one closest to the bow is used. The bow is to the front in the direction of travel. Weight and length have a direct bearing on the ease of carriage. They govern the amount of energy required. With a light canoe, the weight can be cushioned by wearing a life jacket or wrap towel. Some canoes have a built-in carrying yoke. If not, it can be created with two paddles. This is achieved by tying them between the thwart and the bow seat. The blades are to the rear. The canoe is supported by extending your hands slightly to the front on each side gunnel. This prevents it from tipping either forward or backwards. The bow must be slightly higher than the stern to see in front. There are two ways of lifting the canoe. With the first, place it on the ground right side up. Raise it with your arms to the knees, bending them slightly so it rests against them upright. Then change your hold so you can lift it over your head. Assuring you have a firm grip, lift upwards while at the same time turning it so it comes to rest on your shoulders. The second manner can be affected as shown. In this case, however, assure the stern is blocked to prevent shifting. To lower the canoe, simply reverse the lifting procedure. Now for a brief recap before we proceed. We have shown how a canoe can be emptied and righted with the assistance of another. By two occupants, raising each end. Or one occupant, lifting it from underneath. 
how in addition, it can be rocked until sufficient water is removed for re-entry. And that re-entry is best affected over the bow or stern. We have also looked at loading and portaging. These matters covered, let's sweep on to both the challenge and excitement of white water. Don't even consider it until you are an accomplished canoeist. It's not for novices. When you do run, and especially at the beginning, remove all gear from the canoe. A sudden shift in weight, wrong stroke or error in judgment will result in a capsize or swamping. Not only may the canoe and gear be lost or damaged, but you can also suffer severe injury. If traveling with a group, one canoe at a time should run the course. Thus, if there are any hidden obstructions, the current is too fast, or a mishap occurs, the effect will be isolated. When traveling a river or channel, be alert for any sign of turbulence or increase in the current. Be aware a headwind can offset the sound of fast water or a falls. If there is any question of changing conditions, pull to shore and explore ahead on foot. When there are two persons in the canoe, the bow paddler is the leader. This person must watch ahead to avoid obstructions and either initiate or affect diversionary paddle strokes. Always wear a life jacket and kneel on the bottom. A sure gear is well balanced and fully secure. All occupants must work together to perform the necessary strokes with exact timing. If the canoe turns sideways in the current, remain calm. This is when experience pays. You must instantly determine the necessary stroke to remedy the situation by redirecting the canoe, either bow or stern, first into the current. Whitewater travel requires skill, experience, and split-second timing. Now, for a few tips on fast water conditions. The current is normally greater in the center than at the sides. It is also greater on the inside than the outside of a bend. An inverted V, bubbling wave or crest, marks an obstruction. Avoid at all times. A V indicates swift movement of water between obstructions. If wide enough, it is usually safe to run. If an obstruction suddenly appears, it can be avoided by a procedure called ferrying. This is initiated by using the backstroke to slow or stop forward motion. Using the push or draw strokes, either or both of the bow and stern can be moved in the direction desired. While an exhilarating experience, fast water travel is risky and dangerous. Before venturing forth, be prepared. And once underway, be careful. That's our look at some of the techniques you must master to become an accomplished canoeist. Keep in mind that practice makes perfect. <laughs>